So this is Jack and Jack. Welcome to the Jack Show, right? This is Ask Jack, Ask Jacks, right? So this is Jack and I'm Jack. Um, so um, Jack, I got your, I was just looking for it, but I think it is in the other room. Um, I got that wonderful red-tailed hawk that you drew. Love it. Love it. It just, it's, it just sort of has that feeling of hawkiness. And thank you so much for the, 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 the sculpted gift. Great, um, uh, wonderful kind of artifact of your adventure out there. And is that a bald eagle feather we're looking at? Um, I don't really know what that feather is, but I think it might be a bald eagle. Yeah, it, it kind of reminds me of that other bald eagle feather you found, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty cool. Thank you so much. Um, so welcome. you have just been in exploring the greater Yellowstone ecosystem <laughs> and thought it'd be really fun to check in on your journals. We had a couple of classes on drawing um, greater Yellowstone ecosystem, large mammals. Um, and um, I'm going to remove my spotlight. Do you want to share with us what you, what you observed? Mm -hmm. It was really cool. We stayed in Idaho. It was Victor, Idaho, and um, we 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 visited the Grand Tetons a lot, which was really cool. And on the way to the cabin, like the first night when we flew in, after one night we stayed, we flew in, drove to the hotel in Salt Lake City, and then the next day we drove the four-hour drive down to um, the cabin we were staying in up in Idaho. And on our way there, it was nighttime by the time we were almost there, the, near the driveway, and we saw a big moose. A male or a female? I've had, how do you tell if it's male or female? Um, at this time of year, there'd be antlers on the males. Yes, it had antlers, oh. really big antlers. <laughs> and we got some pictures, we got some pictures of it. It was really cool, and, but it was kind of dark, so it was kind of hard to see, but the flash really got it. So that, that was really cool. And then one for one day, we only did it one day because we had everybody and it was um, and it was a three hour drive, four hour drive, I think, up to Yellowstone. But we got to see Old Faithful, the geyser and the Grand Prismatic Spring. It's like a really colorful spring. Yeah. And we we didn't see any bears, but my little brother claims to have seen a little baby black bear when we were driving home. And that's great. And we did see a big heart of bison, and one, and on the way home we saw like a lone bison by the stream, which was really cool under the moon. Oh, that's wonderful! Do you have some uh, journal entries of what yeah. you? And I'm not sure. I think this is a magpie, but I wasn't sure. Is this a magpie? Oh, that is such a magpie. Absolutely. Yep. And for yeah. That, with, yeah, with, with, with the bluish on the wings. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I got all this detail because we were able to get um, a really close up picture with the camera because um, we were, when we were driving back from it, it was like a big magpie field and there were magpies flying all inside the long, tall grass. And on on the fence like right next to our car was a magpie and i guess magpies eat meat because it had like a half dissected mouse in its talons claws do they eat um meat too absolutely absolutely you also will see them scavenging on carcasses yeah so it was like a like you could see the jaws and like the fur and what was left of a mouse and we went to this it was it was a really hard hike um, but we also had my little sister is two, so she was doing it too, and she was doing it too. <laughs> and we went, we went to this lake, and it, the same name as the trail. It's called the Taggart Lake Trail, and it was like three point one miles to and back. So it was pretty um, treacherous. It was uphill and rocky, so we had to ditch the stroller um, because Vivian would ride in the stroller. That's my um, little sister's name, and but we had, it was so uphill, we had to hide the stroller behind a big boulder and and get it on our way back. But it, it was definitely worth it. It was a really cool lake. Ooh. Wow, I've really got a sense of, of depth there, how that water that is further away from you, you're seeing the reflection of the sky up there 
And I love the silhouette of the Tetons way in the background. Yeah, and, and um, there were a lot of these growing in, I guess, where we live, they were really, it's actually the state tree, I think, the aspen tree. So I got the bark and stuff and the leaves. Oh, aren't aspen trees so much fun? Yeah, I was wondering, do you know why there's like black? Is that like um, decay or something? So any place that the skin of the aspen tree, the, the bark of the aspen tree gets rubbed or scratched, um, we're going to see these black marks, these black scars. Um, we also get, um, um, and, and so uh, actually in the Sierra Nevada mountains, um, there are places where Basque sheep herders, 100 more years ago, um, have carved images in trees. And those galleries, if you go, know the right place to go, you go out to these sort of very just remote, this aspen grove way up on a hill, you can find these galleries of paintings and political slogans that Basque sheep herders carved 100 years ago. Um, wow, because like when they carved it, the aspen trees turned black and you could really see, see the writing it st stood out. Exactly, exactly. And, and also if a bear scratches on the trees, then you get these, you'll see these bear, these, 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 these bear marks, these bear claw marks, these vertical sets of four or five lines <laughs> um, scratched on the, on the tree. And the, um, with, with those, I'm gonna kind of join back in on the, the video. Um, so on the tree bark, um, if you were to be a bear and scratch the tree like this, as that tree grows, your the, the 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 scratch mark isn't going up because the tree's not growing from the bottom; it's growing from the top. So it stays at the same height. But as the tree gets bigger around, you'll see that the the, the scratches in the claw marks get wider and wider and wider apart. So on a fresh one, you can tell whether it's a grizzly bear or a black bear claw mark because or or that if it's if it's a really large, uh, fresh one, then you know it was grizzly bear because they have the wider paws. Um, but if it's a smaller one, that could be a young grizzly or it could be the black bear. Um, but on an old one, the tree's getting wider and wider and wider. So those claw marks are getting further apart, but they stay at the same height. Um, so that's kind of a, a fun thing. I think maybe this kind of is an inspiration uh, uh, for, for us to mess with a little bit of tree bark today. Mm -hmm. And I had another one. We'd love to As see it. Let me on our minimize way, me. On our way to the cabin, we were just, it was really cool. The drive was really cool, especially in the daytime. We were just dri it was driving through the mountains and stuff. And I did a little, I did the road and a little picture of the mountains and the landscape. Oh, what a great idea. And I love the road going into it. Oh, that's really cool. Hey, um, just bounce back to that picture of the lake, would you, for one moment? Because um, there's something really cool that you're doing there that I want to point out to people. So, so uh, we're seeing kind of the, the side of the tree on one side, that other tree coming down. So notice the tree on the left is painted, the tree on the right is not. Notice that the silhouette of the mountains is just done with a pencil line. The lake close to you is um, is, uh, is 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 finished out with the watercolor. By incorporating parts of this drawing that are finished and parts that are not, you kind of are able to see into Jack's journaling process here. I think that journal uh, sort of sketches like this, where it's partially unfinished, are often. They're, they're faster to do, and they're often much more visually interesting than um, if you kind of, tr uh, kind of noodle the whole thing out. So Jack is being really playful here with how he's doing this, leaving some things um, uh, unpainted, other things painted. And then you're seeing also um, kind of he's being playful with, let's jump back to that going down the road to the mountains in the background. Um, you know, look at how he's also just sort of being playful with his nature journal here. Here you are driving down the road, right into that 
um, that, that little um, in, into the mountains in the background. That's really fun. I really love the, the road into the landscape you there. And um, I wasn't able to full, um, fill up a journal, but I was able to, and, I, and it was also just fun. Like um, we, we did it with our cousins too. Our, my Nana and Papa and our cousins were, all, and the rest of my family was, we were all staying in one cabin and it was a lot of fun. And some days um, we were just hanging out at the house and we all had dinner together and we played Mexican train dominoes. And some of the days we did like a whole travel day and we traveled down to Yellowstone or traveled down to Tetons and it was a lot of fun. That is great. That is and, fantastic. And um, I also didn't get that many journals in because I don't know if I've told you, but um, a few, it was the week before my birthday. I was, I think this kind of triggered it, but um, I did something to my knees and I was on crutches the entire time of the trip. Mm. So, so that kind of stunk, but it was a lot of fun. It was a, definitely a lot of fun. Well, I hope you're back on your feet soon. And I'm just glad you had such a great time out there. Thank you so much for sharing those journal entries with us, Jack. And welcome yeah. home. And uh, thank you for, your, for sharing your adventures in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Thank you. That was great to see. Uh, so let's take a look at uh, tree bark. Um, so, the, <clears throat> so looking at tree bark can be a very useful clue for identifying trees. And also it is uh, a, a wonderful thing to study in our landscape sketches. If the trees are close enough that you know, you're seeing the, the, the bark of the tree, uh, you'll get those images just like Jack had where the tree will be cutting through. You're not seeing all the way to the top, you're not seeing all the way to the bottom, but you can see other things framed through them. Um, and so we'll take a look at also how to play with that and a few kind of general principles of, um, of, of, uh, of, of depicting those trunks. Um, so in some species, the, like the aspen, um, you, it's, it's very, very diagnostic bark. Um, and so some trees, you know, you can look at them and you know, like, oh, I know what this is. Um, you know, like for instance, you can identify, you know how to identify a dogwood? By its bark. Um, so the, uh, let's, 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 let's play with this. And I will show you some bark strategies. And um, then we can have um, some fun, um, um, some fun barking. Um, let's see here, we are going to go to, oh, I need to plug in my, plug in the frill cam. And give my system a moment to identify the camera. There we go. All right. Now, let's play with some tree bark. I'm going to put my camera down, center this. Let's zoom down a notch and that is my, we'll see, yeah, this works great. You know, very often, you know, the, just the big round stick is just like the cheapest of all big pens. Um, does a dynamite job for 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 nature journaling sketching. Sometimes um, the thing that I like about ballpoint pens is that you can you can press hard with it and you can get a dark smudge. Um, you can also go lighter and get a lighter mark. You can go really light and just like a pencil, you can kind of get a gradation of darks with it. So just taking, um, what I'd like to do is to, to take a, a, a pen and see what kind of, 
what kind of gradation are you able to make with it? If you're doing something like a gel pen um, or a fiber tip pen, like a, 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 a flare fiber tip pen, like something like this, or, or let's go with this here. You know, no matter what pressure you do, it's doing the same thing. And so this pen doesn't want to give you a gradation like that because it's just, you just get your ink. But pencils and a ballpoint pen, you're gonna be able to get some, some values. Let's first just sort of think about the trunk geometry. So I'm sitting here and I'm looking at a tree and here is my tree. Oh, you know what I need? I need to grab a cucumber out of the refrigerator. Hold on, this is gonna help, this is gonna be good. All right, here is the tree. Now, when I look at this from this perspective, um, I see that my tree, I basically see I've got two sides here. And this is, but we know that this is, this is a rounded tree coming towards me. But if I draw these two lines, I get something like this. It doesn't look really rounded. So, um, Let's think a little bit about cross contour lines on this and how that is going to really help me. Now, if I, um, if I cut my tree here, I get Oops, there you go. I get this straight line right across, whoops. I get this straight line right across my tree. So at eye level, something that cuts across the tree, it goes all the way around the tree. You're going to see that as a straight line right across the tree. So what I'm gonna do is, here's my tree. Here is a line painted all the way around the tree. So this is if I am standing next to this tree and looking at it. So here is, here is Jack. We're not gonna tell you which one, all right? This is either Jack or it's Jack, all right? And Jack is looking at the tree and that makes a straight line right across the tree. But, if Jack is looking up the tree, or Jack is looking down lower, not at eye level, what you see is something else. So if I hold the tree here, and so, so you're looking at where you just see that straight line. As you start to look lower, what you're going to see is the oval of the bottom of this appearing. So as you go down, as you look down, you are starting to look down, you'll see the oval of the stump. Similarly, as you start, so if you're to look down here, you'd be looking at the surface of that stump. Take a look at the shape of this edge. See how it goes straight? From now, now it's slightly, the close edge here is a slight curve up like a smile. And as I go down further on the page, that becomes more of a smile. As I go up on the page, then what is happening is you are now looking up at that. You don't see the smile, you see the frown of that close edge. See how that, this edge comes up, it's higher here than at the sides. All right, so if you're looking up at the tree, a cross contour line is going to do this. 
looking down, a cross contour line is going to do this. And if you had 3D specs on, or if you were to actually cut that tree down, then what you'd be seeing there is sort of the oval of the stump. Now looking further down, this is more of a smile. And looking further up, this would be more of an arc around like that. So this is our first little thinking of kind of cross contour lines. and what they're going to be doing on your tree. Now let's think about lines going along the axis of the tree here. So let's say I have a line here in the middle of my tree. All right. As I rotate this, So as you rotate this, this vertical line stays vertical, right? It just gets closer to the edge, closer to the edge, closer to the edge. Now, notice that when it's right here, it's easy to see, right? The closer it gets over to the edge, it becomes a little bit like it's now almost at the edge, but notice on your screen here that it's almost, we almost can't see it. Come back here a little bit, and like, oh, there it is again. Let's make this a little bit broader, a little bit bigger, easier to see. So there is the vertical line, the crack, as it comes over to the side here. Notice that that's, that's just, it's just a little bit harder to see. And it's right there, and it's really kind of skinny. Comes back in here, and it's really bold. Let's now add two cracks here. Whoops, I want it to be straight. Ah. something inside there that doesn't want me to make a really straight line. I wonder what that is. All right, so now I've got, well, we'll see if we have three cracks. Here's three cracks on the face of this. As I rock it this way, notice, look at the space between these cracks, All right? Do you see the space between these cracks, All right? As it comes over to the side, All right? Right here, as I get close to the edge, this apparent, this, the, the width of this space is smaller than the width of this space. Let's take this one step further. Just to belabor this point a little bit more. Is my ah. Let's take a look at this at how big a centimeter is around the sides here. So around the sides of this, so here where it says 20, that from here to here is one centimeter, from 20 to 19. Now look from 
19 to 18, that is it, maybe that smaller, but we actually can see all the way to 17 over here. You're seeing 17. Look at how narrow the, the how small the distance between um, 18 and 17 is. Compare that with the distance between, say, 20 and 21 here. So as you get more wrapped around the sides, what's happening is that lines that are evenly spaced out are going to start to appear to be closer together. So I'm going to expect lines to be closer together out here. I'm going to expect um, lines, sort of the, the gaps between things to be smaller out here. Also lines that, if you imagine that these are cracks in this tree where you're sort of seeing into the shadows in them there, as you get closer out towards the sides, in addition to these cracks getting closer together, you're also going to see that they are, you're not seeing as deeply into those cracks. So I'm going to draw them just a little bit more lightly and closer together. And then as I come towards the center of the tree, I'm going to start to get bigger spaces more widely. So towards the sides, I'm going to have things close together and lighter, more indistinct cracks towards the center, deeper ones. For things that are going across, if it's at eye level, that's going to be a line like this. If um, there are cracks and things that are going uh, or marks that are going across this way, those towards my feet are going to be smiling. And above my head, those are going to be frowning. So let's put this together in an imaginary tree trunk. <clears throat> Here is just two sides. And let's say this tree has vertical scratches. Um, I'm going to just put some of these in as kind of tight, irregular things towards the sides. Then you're thinking like, oh no, how do I kind of now work this kind of gradation? You don't. Just throw a few big ones in the center here and let those sort of be more kind of widely spaced. And people's, people will be able to look at this and kind of go like, oh, you know, somewhere, you know, you, you don't have to kind of mathematically figure out like what the distances are going to be between these. Just get on the sides closer together, in the center, bigger, deeper cracks. Now I'm going to change the bark texture here. Some trees, like the western white pine, have these cool bark pieces that kind of look like squares. It's very geometric. So if that is what's kind of going on here on my tree, um, let's say this is your eye level. Then, you know, essentially you're going to have bark pieces here where you're, you're seeing, let's kind of make them just regularly irregular. But as I kind of go up here, notice how I'm kind of, this line here is curving. I'm thinking like this. I'm thinking up here, these are going to be things I'm bringing horizontally. I want to arch these. So if I'm drawing a little piece in here,
and if there are Just draw a few more of these in. As, as we go towards the sides, those will get smaller. And then down in here, I'm going to start sort of thinking of these things kind of curving this way. So I'll make these lines kind of curve up. I'm going to add a few kind of deeper cracks in a few places. And since I'm working with toned paper, if the light's coming in from this side here, I'm just going to add a few kind of irregular spots on that surface of the tree there. And I'll do it on the other side. So I want to, I can, you can get my combo in there. I'll like, oh, work with some shadows. So let's go for a, a tree with a different type of texture. <clears throat> let's say there's an aspen out there, a little aspen grove. Now, so I'm going to have You go up a little bit. Hey, I caught myself that time. <laughs> Are you proud of me, Avea? Um, so um, all these aspen trunks right here. Um, aspens, there's this really kind of cool thing that happens where there's a, um, where a branch is broken off an aspen. You'll get these leaf scars that kind of look like this. It'll be this sort of dark mark with this above it, it kind of makes it look like um, used to when I taught with um, kids, we talk about how these uh, like was that like when the bird dies in the forest, its uh, life then flies into one of the aspen trees, and that's a little mark because it was on the downstroke. See, there's a little body there, it kind of looks like a bird flying away from, or maybe towards you. Um, so if there's one of those on the aspen tree here. One that is pointing towards you, let's just think of that circular, circular spot there. Uh, on the surface that is pointing towards you, you're going to see it as a circle. But of course, an oval that is on the side of the tree is pointing. Just imagine if you had a cube. On a side that is at an angle, you're going to see more of a spot that is sort of a horizontal spot. And on the face that is pointing towards you more, you're going to see those circles as being more round. So if there is another one of these little scars like this that's pointing off on the side, I'm going to draw that as a vertical oval. There's another little vertical oval. And one that is pointing more center with the tree. It's going to be like that. Now I'll put those little wings with it. Uh, 
and the uh, sap suckers are really wonderful, wonderful woodpeckers. Um, the uh, sap suckers um, will cruise around and um, they will drill these little wells in tree bark. And um, they will then kind of work their way around the tree. Uh, this one has a huge head. Um, but what they're doing is they're, they're, they're doing just making a little divot in the bark of the tree. And then as the bird comes around the tree, it continues drilling. And so you get this line of holes at the same height on the tree. So if that happens at this height, I'm going to see those as little lines like that on my aspen tree. And if I'm looking above that, then I'm going to get these wonderful little kind of sets of, of, of contours. These little lines help me sort of show how this tree is wrapping around. And if I'm looking down, it's going to be the same thing. And then what they do is they come back later and they will, there will be sap leaking, leaking out of these and they'll lick that up with their sort of feathery tongue as well as get any insects that are caught in these. And then those leave these little kind of lines of dark scars on the aspen trees. Again, arching up, frowning above, smiling below. Um, there also can be places where there are, are still branches sticking out of the tree. There's a few little branches sticking out there. If these are aspen trees and I want them to look really light, the way you make anything look light is you put something dark next to it. If I want these to look light, I'm going to do that by putting some dark paint right next to it. There's some endatherum blue. The darker I make those, the lighter the trees get. Add a little bit of white. And as I do this, I'm going to be thinking about the direction that the kind of the contours go on these trees. So my pencil is kind of wrapping around. See how I'm curving up here with frowns? 
my pencil is making frown marks here. And so if I'm doing this here, I'm up, I'm making frowns. So my pencil is doing marks that have a frown shape. And as you get more towards the center line, your lines are flat towards the bottom, smiles. Um, I really like uh, Prismacolor pencils for putting in um, my, my general go-to pencil for um, for doing colored pencil drawings are um, the Faber Castell Polychromos pencils. I'll get out one of those. Um, here's one. Here's the white one. Um, but for generally um, putting white on, I'm finding that the Prismacolor pencil gives me a brighter, more intense white than my Polychromos does. So what I'll do is I'll just as a little test here. This is pressing hard with my Polychromos pencil. This, so this is Um, this is pressing hard with my um, Prismacolor. The Prismacolor is a lot more waxy, but I think I find it to be just a little bit more kind of um, opaque. My general preference though for, for drawing with colored pencils is to use the, the Faber Castell polychromos. Um, but I do like when I you know want to put a little highlight in something and I want it to kind of pop and be more opaque, I'll often reach for a Prismacolor pencil. Um, and uh, that that's 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 useful for me. Um, let's Let's go over by that big oak tree over there. So we're going to go. Next time I'll eat lunch before the workshop. So let's check this out. We're now underneath an oak tree. And there is a big gnarly old trunk that is sticking up. And it's got some roots that are sticking down into the ground. Um, you want to make this. So what I want, I don't want, I don't want my trunk to start narrow and then get wide. So you see up here, I have this width and the width of this. What I put down below that wants to be thicker, as thick or thicker than the width of both of these combined. So if my tr tree trunk was like this, that wouldn't work out very well because this is, this is actually smaller than this. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to widen this out down here. And now I have a smaller, a bigger section that can support a smaller section up above. I'm going to put some cracks in this, this is going to be, um, so here are some cracks on the side, and then a few kind of 
bigger ones in the middle. Very often where a, a brand, a, a, you'll see that when you get a, a um, branch coming in like this, so right in here in this area, um, you're going to see, and in here, sometimes there's kind of, um, you can imagine this sort of like, you know, parts of your shirt sleeve kind of curling up. And so you can get some wrinkles in the, the, the bark in there. But along the sides of the, this, I'm going to just have a few kind of just cracks that are close to the edge. So I often will start just by Maybe some grasses sticking up here. But here I'm going to just have this, this trunk coming down in the middle of it here. Imagine that this is sort of where your eye line is. <clears throat> I'm going to, if any marks are kind of curving around like this, I'm going to have those making the smile lines. Now, if you're doing this from a real tree out in front of you, the great thing you can do is pay attention to the shape of the tree. Go look at the actual tree and squint at it. Where are, where am I seeing these dark cracks and things? This is just sort of a general rule that we're looking at here. Um, some cracks along this side. The idea here is to be consistently inconsistent. Around these trunk, these roots that are coming in here, I want this to be um, a cylinder of roots coming out towards me. So if I imagine that as a cylinder and it's coming out towards me, these lines, these contour lines, are going to be curving around that way on it. So that means, see this curve here, anything that is kind of curving around that, I'm gonna avoid putting kind of cracks in evenly spaced. Consistently inconsistent. Um, up in here, let's put a little. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. As Bob Ross used to say, you know, let's let let's find a little place in here where where, where a squirrel might want to live. Um, so if there's a going to be maybe some little cavity in there. Agree, Bob? Oh yeah. Um, I'm just going to wrap some little kind of contour lines around the edge of that so that this, I want to sort of imagine that, you know, you're kind of curving in here, you drop, you can curve into that. Um, the sun's coming in from that side. Um, I'm also going to have um, shadows cast across this whole business. 
from leaves that are up in, in, in here. So oh, shadows of branches, you'll see those kind of curving across something and making curved shapes. Those are the shadows of the branches that are up above. And then there'll be just some areas of leaves and foliage. Have some places where you show details, have some places where you don't. What you're gonna find is once you start putting in cracks, it's gonna be fun to put in cracks. And look at this, if I do little cracks and things all the way across the whole thing, then there's so much more just like it's all the same. It's not as interesting. Um, so leave, leave some places where, so I'm just going to suggest that there's some kind of cracks and detail up in here. But you want to have places for your eye to rest. Probably too much fussing on in there. Then there will be some branches that are hanging down you know, leaves. For that, I'm just going to make a little squiggly line. My leaves are going to be above that. And there are also going to be other leaves in the background. And for that, I'm just going to use an area of tone. If you're having trouble knowing when to stop, you can always just put a frame around to be like, how do you stop drawing those leaves out there? You just drop in a frame. And then you can go out until you get to the edge of the frame. So everybody understands that drawing stop at frames. It's fun to have it break the frame there, right? I'm going to just by bringing my pencil uh, or pen at some different angles. That's all done with ballpoint pen. <clears throat> Mark Simmons showed me these pens, this blue, uh, the zebra pen. Um, these are available on my website store if you want to sort of figure out like the model of them. Um, but they're neat because you can make a thin line, you press a little bit large, harder, and you get a thick line. Same pen. And so I can kind of come in some places and pop out a little bit of line variation. Put that in with some cracks. You can kind of come down in a crack and it's thin, then you can be thick and thin, and then you kind of get this, this, this sort of consistently inconsistent effect. And so I've got that. And then just to wrap this up, um,
Mm. Don't know if that's the best bent rope that I've ever done, but then you get to figure out if my bark is worse than my bite. Not joke for folks who are into it. Um, so that, my friends, is a little bit of fun with um, uh, a little bit of fun with the uh, with, with playing with bark, and I hope that you enjoyed that. Um, it's really useful to sort of think about like our, you know, think of, think about those cross contour lines. Imagine things getting closer together as you get towards the sides. You don't have to systematically draw them in like a grid. Uh, uh You just have a few things close together on the sides, a few things more widely spaced in the middle of the tree. And you're off to the races. Um, okay, let, let me just do, let's just do one, one more quick treat, one more quick treat, um, just to kind of show like how easy this, this system is like redwood tree redwood tree. We're going to go for a redwood tree, bark of a redwood tree. Um, so long strips of stuff. Let's change media. I'm going to go into a um, let me see. I need a pencil. Here is a here is a quick redwood tree. I have sides of my redwood tree that come down. And if I make that just a little bit rough, instead of just completely straight, it's it might be even useful to um, Uh, useful to look at um, do that sort of the blind contour thing like what is you know where is the edge of this thing straight and actually right here is a little branch that sticks off all right now um, towards the edges so we're going to go for big cracks but we're going to put these ones closer together on the sides. And then a few places in the middle of the tree. So that was just like, so here's just simple treatment on the edges. And a few places in the middle of the tree. Where I'm gonna make some larger vertical things more widely spaced. And then in between those, maybe just all I need is like, look, there's something that might be in between. And because of the irregularity of trees, that's all you really need to kind of separate that from, from what you're seeing. Another tree in the background. There you go. <clears throat> Just a little bit about bark. Now, there's no bark formula. Bark's on trees. So go look at trees. <laughs> and just use these general ideas to, to help you think about, um, uh, to, to think about um, how to capture the details of the real tree that's in front of you.
and just sort of think about like it, you know, where I'm seeing horizontal, that how's the, the angle of that going to change? Where I'm seeing things getting towards the sides, how's that going to affect the spacing of things and how like in your face they are? Again, in the center of a tree, if there's a big deep crack, you're going to be seen down into that. A big deep crack that's out on the sides of the tree, um, it, you aren't seeing into the deepest shadow of that. So notice how, like, you look at my ear. Yeah, there's some darker spaces in there. But when I kind of turn this way, now you're kind of looking into, like, the cracks in the tree, right? So the, um, you know, in there, you can sort of really sort of see sort of deeper into that. But when I just turn my head like this, you know, you're, you're seeing kind of the, more along the sides of it. Um, I hope that that was some fun. And... Um, let's see. Um, oh, I'm just looking at the notes here. Um, Ivea, there's going to be um, the, the Mad Botanist Returns. Oh, tell us a little bit about that. That's so cool to hear. Oh, yeah. So um, it, it might take me like about a month or so to work out the details, but I'll be doing uh, Botany Round 2 if anybody wants to do more plant families in our foods. And I see a family that we're going to be including. <laughs> That's the only freebie I'm giving. Everything else, though, you have to be surprised. Um, but more plant families in our foods. Um, might consider after this one branching out into just wild families in general. Um, but yeah, look for that in like about a month or so for some more botany fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, about eight families, I'm thinking. If anybody has any special requests, you can write to me and let me know and I'll consider them. Um, and if you need, I don't know, to review and if the families are, like if I didn't include enough info, let me know. I might consider, you know, doing some, redoing a couple of the families if people want some more info, you know, like the crazy grasses or the, or the why are the Asteraceae everywhere kind of families. Just let me know, that's all, <laughs> thanks. That that's really cool. People had so much fun at the. So if you're interested, like you want to wrap your head around botany, this is such a great approachable way to do it. Like you know, just we're gonna just do a few fa plant families at a time, and then we're gonna find is you go through that, you're gonna do a deep dive each class on those plant families, and then you're gonna walk around and you're going to see those critters everywhere. Like I never knew I was walking in a world of asters. Yes. And also just to reassure people, it's it, you can totally come with no experience in botany. At the very beginning, we go over the very basic diagram each time. Um, so so you don't have to know a ton of things. And soon enough, soon I'm going to be posting Jack's video um, about the um, about about uh, stems and arrangements on those. And as he says, and as I reiterate, you don't have to know the vocabulary. We, we introduce vocabulary, we talk about it, but you don't actually have to know it. It's just more about learning how to see these, these plants and see the patterns so that they feel a little bit more familiar for you. Um, so that's what it's about more than anything. And also I can't promise nearly as awesome puns as Jack, but I can promise that there will be horrible plant puns too. So if that's oh, your you, name. Oh, you can count on it. Look out, <laughs> it is dangerous. Oh, so I just thought like, like you see, you see that little diagram there? All right, now watch this. Disaster. That was good. <laughs> All right, everybody. Um, let's let's jump over to our uh, community cam here. Um, see who is uh, hanging out with us. If there are Nature Journal pages that you would like to share, questions, comments, thoughts, or ideas, maybe something from this workshop or something from a different workshop we can and will. Um, so you can do that several ways. You can raise your hand using the raise hand bun button. You can also hold your journal up to the screen and um, we can um, try to find um, everybody that way. So I wanted to ask you a question. When you got the package I sent you, um, you got the card and the um, feather, right? And the cutout of the grizzly bear. Okay, so I thought you hadn't gotten that. Um, my mom thought that like you hadn't noticed the piece of cardboard. cardboard. Oh, oh, no, 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 I, I yeah. got that. That is, is so yeah. cool. Big. I was just 
I was making I, sure. It's a really neat kind of example of how uh, sort of negative shapes can can make an, uh, an item. I wanted to hold it up here, but it's in the other room. Um, but um, and when we were out, I forget what place we got it, but I got this hat. Oh, oh, how cool! Great horned. That is neat. That's uh, mad props to the graphic artist who created that. Yeah, um, my mom and dad actually met the artist. I wasn't there, but um, my mom and dad went to like an art fair in town, and they got and the artist was actually there, and she was selling these hats. What like she? This was her um, drawing, but she had made a patch out of it. That's really neat. That's really neat. The uh, yeah, support your local artists. Um, the uh, you know if uh, that, that's that's really cool to see. Jack, thanks so much for sharing that. Yeah, you know, whoever that artist was, he or she made a, a really cool logo. And um, I just wanted to let you know that the grizzly bear I made. You made the grizzly bear. Oh, okay. See, I thought it was cool before. Now it's going on my wall right there. <laughs> hey, thanks, man. Tell me the story of. of of making it. next next time I, I I have a class where well, people will be able to see that on the wall behind me. Um, tell me the story about making that. Um, I didn't know you were a woodcarver. I I got a little I got out of it a little, but I used to really love um, using a scr scroll saw to cut out um, piece of wood to make like um, pictures and stuff. So here's a, here's another one I made. Dude, check you out. <laughs> I also made um, this dragon. Whoa. Oh man, Jack, this is this is next level cool. Oh man, see, I I I love my bear. I love that bear. And I I um oh are, are the designs on these, are you also coming up with the designs? I don't come up with designs. I have this um, really cool book, and it, and you can like photocopy the pictures, and um, then you can use those to um, cut cut out the pieces. Hey, Jack, that's really cool. My, I think you've also blown my friend Chloe's mind. We'll hear from her shortly. Um, oh, that's so cool, man. That is really really neat. Tell me the name of the saw again. Um, it's a scroll saw. I think it's, huh? It's a Delta scroll saw. It's a Delta brand scroll saw. We've had it for a while um, in our shop downstairs. Oh, that's really neat. Um, that's and, great, Jack. And at, and the wood, it's a, I think it's chestnut. I yeah, know. it's walnut that the, the wood that the bear, the grizzly bear is um, made of. And that wood, uh, there's like a woodworking show um, down, down the road from where we live. And, um, they have like a contest. There's a youth division and a adult division. And every year I enter the contest and enter one of my pieces in. And, um, it's kind of like weird. Nobody, nobody else in the youth division has entered. Like I'm the only one. So I always win, but, um, <laughs> one, one time I got like, and in the back, there's like, people can sell like stuff they've made and, um tools and in the back there's like all this wood wood slabs and the um wood that your grizzly bear is made out of is i want i won that slab of wood when i won one year uh that's great i love the story behind that um next time uh we have workshop i will be bringing my grizzly bear um it's not easily accessible right now but i'll bring in my grizzly bear and show everybody my grizz um okay oh that's that's fantastic jack I'm, I'm really excited and I'm, I'm really moved that um, you, uh, you shared some of your creativity and your art with me. So thanks, man. You're welcome. Hey there. <laughs> just a really quick. I've just been really enjoying looking at thistles. Oh, it's a really bad picture, sorry. Oh, but look at, look at the, 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 you can just get a sense from the way that you've handled the watercolor. Look at the sort of the variation in these flowers, um, how part of it is lighter, part of it is more intense color, and that um, 
because that's with a consistent direction, it gives you sort of a sense of the curvature of those thistle. Off. And also everybody look at the variation in intensity of the paint in the thistle leaves themselves. Sorry, it's really bad light. Yeah, I just, it was so enjoyable because just, I just wanted to say, cause I did it in, um, I did it outdoors and yep. loads of people, loads of people stopped and talked to me about the thistles. So it was just really felt like a really good thing to be doing. And there was tiny spiders living inside the thistles, but where I live, they're seen as weeds. So, um, they're very tall and beautiful, but they're in a kind of weed area that people just ignore. So yeah, it was just really, really good to be standing there because a lot of people stopped and kind of went, oh, I walk past these every day and I've never looked at them. So I was really pleased. And isn't it interesting how that happens? How yeah. when we are, when you give special attention to something like this, all of a sudden other people walking by see the beauty in this really but good. your notes and journal page are the window that they needed to see that through they needed yeah. to see that this was worthy of this kind of attention and that there's beauty there when you do it was great and also that i thought the leaves i thought that was loads of leaves like about 10 leaves and then it was only when i drew it that i realized the thistle leaf kind of goes in uh, every direction. Do you know what I mean? Yes, I do. I, sorry, it's a terrible light because it's dark. But yeah, yeah so that was really good. That was a really good. Oh, output. that's that's really fun. I like how you're showing the undersides, the top sides, that little bit of shadow. So folks notice here that Debbie has, so in some places, watercolor, life size, then using the pen drawing just to drop in details on that leaf and then getting further away, the little sketch of Debbie standing next to the plant that gives you a sense of the scale and the size of this. Um, all these elements together with the writing makes for such a page just filled with dynamic interest and there's stuff going on. So go for a data dense page like this. This is really cool to see. It was, I really enjoyed it, it was good, <laughs> thanks. That's great. Um, next, I'd like to bring on my friend, Chloe. Um, hey there, Chloe. Hi, um, Mr. Uh, John. Um, I wanted to show you. Oh, you went down and you, you found the geese. And this is so interesting, the way you have all those different head and neck positions of the, the geese. And then on one of them, you chose to kind of drop in and show the, the color patterns on the detail on it. But notice that she didn't have to do that for everyone. She's doing that for, she just sort of picked out one to show those, those details. And this is also a really good example of um, how, okay, we can hold it a little bit closer. Oh, this is fun. Um, look at the, um, so th that we, we have a really good use of using words to extend the observations even further. So there, um, she's using both label techniques, sort of putting in labels and drawing lines with them, and then also writing things in more kind of sort of uh, sentence form. So, Oh, this is exciting to see. What was for you one of the most interesting parts of that observation experience? Um, wait, what did you say? What, what, what for you was one of the most interesting parts of your um, experience out there observing those geese? Um, well, there was one mama and three babies. So when I was getting closer, a little bit closer, um to the mom to see close up um more she made this cool sound but um i i i didn't write it down because i had when i went back to the table to write it i had forgot what it was 
Yeah. And then, here's an interesting part. When I came to the same, like, distance, she uh, didn't make any sound. Like, she opened up her bill, but it didn't make any sound. Oh, that's really interesting. And it is also, you know, that's just the way our human memories work, right? We think I'm going to remember this crazy sound. And then you get back to the table and you're like, I've forgotten the sound. So sometimes what I'll do in that sort of a situation, like let's say it makes kind of a low hiss as an example, then I will say out loud, low hiss, right? If I say it out loud, my chances of remembering it are better for when I get back to the table. That was a, that was a really, um, rich and dynamic journal page, um, Chloe. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Yeah, and also this was at the duck pond and we think that they were migrating to Canada. Yeah. Ah, what, what do you see that makes you um, suspect that? Well, there's not usually geese there. There's always ducks, but never geese. Interesting, so they might just be passing through. Yeah, and then also the next day they weren't there. Oh, oh, that is really interesting. So maybe geese are on the move. Be interesting for um, other folks in other places to kind of keep an eye open for where, um, when we start seeing geese showing up um, and when that stops. Thank you for, for sharing that, Chloe. Yeah, and on the same day we saw. Um, oh, what's? Why did you see what's happening? A couple were feeding the ducks shredded corn, I think, mm -hmm. like dry corn, but it was all chopped up. Um, and so were were mallards and the geese coming up to that? Uh, no, the geese, the geese stayed in one kind of area, um, but, and they were on the other side and only the ducks came. You know, that's an, an observation that also supports your, their migrating through hypothesis, because if they had been regularly out there at that pond with somebody coming and feeding shredded corn to the geese, then they would probably go like, oh, here's the person who brings the, the, the corn. Let's go over and get some. But I wonder if they didn't come over because they weren't, they're like, like ah, I don't know about these people, don't really trust this, don't really know what's going on there. But the local ducks are always like, food truck has arrived. And they're just running over to the taco truck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's cool. One day, this was a different day, but um, a man was there and he was feeding them dog food. I'm like, ducks eat dog food? And they was going crazy for it. Ducks were going crazy for dog food. I did not know that. Interesting. Wow. That's, that's a good thing to know. Oh. I made this cool nature hat. Oh, I see. It's got leaves and is that bark on it and uh -huh. feathers? Yeah, they oh. were just feathers. I like your nature hat. Oh, that's wonderful to see. Let's see it on. Do you ever wear that when you go out journaling? Uh, well, I just made it today. You just made it today? Great. <laughs> I like your nature hat. Very nice. Ah, tip of the hat. <laughs> Good to see you, Chloe. Good to see you too. All right. Um, let's see what else is going on in our club. Um, Cindy's got something to share. Oh, Ray Bonto's here too. Let's jump over to Cindy. Then we'll jump over to Ray Bonto. And um, we will um hey there hi my big news is the hawks that made it had a successful nest we never found the nest i was beginning to think oh no it wasn't successful and then about 10 days ago the birds fledged and it has been just chaos around here since then oh. <laughs> uh, the whole neighborhood is watching um 
so um, I'm getting, I'm having a hard time even getting my pictures and things like that because so much is happening. Um, first, I started out looking at the hawks and determined that the juveniles had yellow eyes or really light eyes and a banded tail. Oh. Um, so I put those down um, and the juveniles- so Notice, notice everybody that Cindy's got this really good show and tell approach. So we show something in our sketch, we also can draw attention to it with our words, because later she might not realize that, oh, the fact that this had this yellow eye, that was a really kind of important, significant observation. So she's highlighting critical details by not just having it in her sketch, but also including that with the written notes. It's a great sort of show and tell technique. So then the, um juveniles were sitting on oh they were everywhere they were sitting on light poles and um in the spruce in our backyard and crying so loudly this one was crying so loudly that i think i spaced its eye and beak too far apart because it was like just that was all i could see was that mouth open and you could actually see its tongue coming out and at the same time i discovered merlin's app for sound oh and yes the coolest thing in the world for someone like me who has a real hard time with bird song um because as i'm sitting in the yard all all um, morning, I'll listen to everybody around me, and I have discovered so many birds in my yard from hearing the songs first. So here, as I was doing the persistent crying, um, I had um, Merlin's spectrogram there too that I put in, and I timed it, and it was like six seconds long, and this it just cried, and it, these things would cry and cry and cry for the parents, and they were standing let's see oh we saw some hummingbirds while we were waiting um and um it would it would stand really upright when it was little and look all around for the parents um and then it was a big deal when it started looking down a little bit and starting to hunt and the parents up the road um two houses um, the parents apparently were teaching these guys to hunt and dropping the prey and, the, and they were going after them. And they decided this fenced in yard was the perfect place and they would go there every day and um, oh. the babies to hunt. But back at my spruce tree, um, they were up there looking around and then eventually one, um, the little juvenile male, um, I decided one was a male and one was a female because when they sit in the tree together and I could tell they were both juveniles by their banded tails and light eyes, mm -hmm. the female was so much bigger. Mm -hmm. um, but the male would sit there a lot and um, he started learning to fly and he would jump off that spruce tree, but instead of launching himself out and flying, he'd just fall and flap and flap and flap and flap. Oh. So, he went through all these stages right in my backyard of learning to fly. So I started thinking about what skills does this bird need to learn to fly? And then if I'd see a behavior that was that skill, I'd note it down. Um, and it took him a long time before, I think, before they learned to soar. At least I didn't see them soaring for a long time. But eventually they also learned um, to, um, and the turns were a little, um, a little um, they weren't so good at the beginning. Um, and it was just chaos in the backyard. So we, um, oh, while listening, I saw my first Carolina wren. I heard it and I thought, I wonder what that bird song is. Yeah. Um, I looked and it was a Carolina wren, which made me walk right through the neighbor's yard and go <laughs> and look at them and see it. Um, but anyway, um, I wanted to oh, get past the Carolina wren here. Oh, this is so much. Oh, show us that little wren. Uh, bring that wren back. Oh, this is actually from that the, is fun. All right. With, this is from the um, International Nature Journaling thing. I went back to one yeah. of the 
to Liz Clayton Fuller. Oh, um, yeah. Doing her gouache on the wren. And I actually did her wren there um, because I wanted to get a better. But before I did her wren, I did my wren. And Look at that big, bold uh, eye stripe. And what, what a, such a beautiful wren with that. Uh, so, Mm. So I decided I'm doing this. I try to do it on my own, sketching out in the backyard, and then I'll go in from a picture and try to draw it. And then I'll go and try and see if I can find somebody else who drew it better than me and see if I can learn from them. <laughs> yeah, all, all those techniques are great to, to combine together. Um, but I wanted to say that one day, um, there were days that were just so chaotic that I just have a few like soaring and things going on and new behaviors. One day, as they learned, I thought, oh, this is great. This um, bird is flying up and he's soaring high. And then he came back and turned and he saw something I'd never done. This was a little male. He just plummeted into the deciduous tree, a Norway maple, and all sorts of chaos uh, broke out. All the robins in that tree came out. And then he, from there, he went and he plummeted into our, um, our um, uh, locust tree. And again, branches were flying and more birds came out and the jays were cawing. And pretty soon, all the trees in of my neighbor's house, our neighbor house, the house behind us, all the birds were either in the air or hiding on the ground under the rhododendrons. And it was just chaos. And I thought, what's happening? And I thought, it seems like he's trying to hunt. But later on in the week, I read a book from the 1960s of some guy who was, um, who was a naturalist and a forest ranger. And he was quoting somebody who said that young juvenile red tail hawks um, will go after songbirds and oh. they don't get them. They go after the healthy ones and they're just flummoxed and don't understand it. And um, then eventually they learn that you, if you're going to go after a small bird, you go after one who's crippled or old. You don't go after the healthy young ones. But I think what I was witnessing was a young bird trying to get some food, but not quite understanding how to do it. Well, he hasn't done that since. That yeah, was- It hasn't figured out that it's not a goshawk. And or next, cougar's hawk. next thing, um, there, uh, my neighbor had a big exercise ball swinging back and forth in her backyard off the spruce. And all of a sudden I heard this thing. I thought someone was shooting air guns at my hawks. And I thought, no, our neighbors wouldn't do that. Or a car was backfiring. Well, I went into her backyard and the big, huge exercise ball was no more. <laughs> we burst. And I thought, I think it's likely that my hawk did that. Um, because it had been up in the tree. Um, well, later on, I was reading in a, on, on the web and it said that hawks do indeed, if they've got a full stomach, they'll go and play hunting and um, do um, hunt for things that aren't you know, necessarily prey to practice their skills. Anyway, it's been super, super exciting out here. I'm trying to do more sketching um, of actually you know, here's he you're trying to launch and how he, the tilts changes, the legs come together. Oh, and, and wow. Just, oh, then, that is, what a great series. Um, getting to the point where I can listen to the, he, they've gone from that persistent cry to a whistle. Um, and I can tell when the whistles are coming in, they're, they're, when they're flying, they are whistling. And also before they take off, they whistle. So um, just today I was able to capture a, um, a video on my iPhone would, of them taking off and flying, which I hadn't been able to do again because I was listening and figured it out that I think this thing is going to fly pretty soon and that was moving. And I'll try to, um, I'll wrap up here, but we've been getting the um, smoke from the Ca Canada wildfires. Oh, yes. And, yeah. Uh, behavior good, that good smoke. I like those, how you put in the map showing the smoke moving east. Yeah, that's a NOAA map of it moving east. Um, I was seeing chimney sweeps down low for the first time today. I, you know, I hear them up high and can see little dots, but today you could actually see them. And the other 
odd thing I've noticed about the hawks is that birds have started harassing them now that they're hunting. And I didn't know if that was what the chimney sweep was doing, but I had never ever seen a chimney sweep this close, but seven of them um, came and circled the spruce going down underneath the hawk and circling around twice and then going on. Um, and I just thought that was really interesting, strange to hear. Wow. Wow. Um, and I also really like the way you're um, also doing kind of metacognitive um, things in your journal. Um, I'm seeing that, you know, you're, you're also sort of playing with, with text sizes and uh, playing with fonts and playing with colors where you put in the red eyed Vireo, you underlined it with a little red line. Um, it, Thank you, you know, Wild I, Wonder. That came from the Wild Wonder Conference and all the things on different kinds of print, as did my little cartoon of me with a ladybug on me and the beetle that I identified later. And that came from your uh, drawing uh, insect things. Um, but this was at my, actually my beetle that was on me that began eating the pollen on my binoculars. Oh, uh, that's great. So I hey. am practicing those things um, and trying to get more of a graphic component or, or art component to it because that does not come naturally. Yeah. Now, and you, you mentioned the Merlin app and we should just sort of uh, kind of highlight this for, for people. It's a free app. Um, it's, it's from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and they did an, a brilliant thing solving um, a real challenge, um, and that is how do you do voice recognition on birds? What they did is they made a, a program which will record bird song that you're listening to and then create for you a sonogram, the little voice print frequency over time diagram, a uh, real time of what you're hearing. So as the birds are going cheepty, 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 you're seeing the little shape of the cheepty, cheepty, cheepties. And then it's hard for the, the, the software, for software to do voice recognition, but it can do sort of pattern recognition stuff on the voice print picture. So they then use the picture to have their software identify the patterns that are made and identify the birds for you. So it'll come up with this list of, uh, the computer will say, I'm hearing this bird, this bird, this bird, this bird, this bird, this bird in the clip that you're listening to right now. And it will highlight which bird is singing at the time. So you can actually know, oh, that's that song. Yeah, that's technology working for me. <laughs> another really, another exciting thing about that app, if he's got your attention, is that today uh, Cornell did a free webinar that'll be posted free on their Facebook page about this app. And it goes, uh, the sound part of it, and it goes from everything from, you know, how do you use it and how might you use birdsong to the coding and the, um, and the machine learning. So there's all sorts of levels of yeah. um, analysis. And it was fascinating. It's an hour long, free. And, and if that sucks you in, I'm going to recommend this book, the Peterson um, Field Guide to Bird Sounds of Western North America, if you're in Western North America. Uh, Nathan Pipolo. Um, his book here, he's come up, he's got the sonograms for all the different birds. So those are the things that you're going to be seeing on the screen. And he has come up with the best system for describing bird songs that um, I have seen. So if you're going to be describing your own bird songs, his system. Bird songs or? I'm sorry, say again. Does he have one for Eastern birds too or just Western? Don't know. Okay. Don't know. That's really cool. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much, Cindy. That was an awesome update. Let's go uh, to bounce over to London and see what's happening with our friend Ray Bonto. Um, Ray Bonto, very good to see you again. Um, hey there, Arpan, good to see you too. Good to see you back, Jack, a long time. It's been been a long time. I've been away, um, but uh, we're, we're we're still in the house. Oh, some. Oh, I, I like these notes. 
those uh, aspen tree with the, um, the dark behind them, that little bit of white there, that how you left the white paper, really makes that white pop out as so bright by having that dark next to it. Did you also use the endatheron blue there? Um, no. Yeah, a little bit. Great. All right. Yeah, there's our, our oak tree. We get to, um, you can just sort of by, by putting the little frame in there, helps you kind of be able to stop with getting up into all those branches. And then I drew this like a fish. Oh, whoa. Is this one of those fighting fish? Yeah. Wow, those are so, those fish are spectacular. I like the dark green color um, behind the head that really makes that light head pop out. And you didn't have to do that behind the entire fish, but behind where you dropped it behind that part that is so light valued really helps me be able to, to, to see that. That's cool. Nice I job on the shadow under the head as well. I didn't use any pencil or pen or any outline. I just did it in watercolor and then put pen over that. Really? So you're now you're now diving straight in. You know, if you're going to be doing more with initially starting with the watercolor, um, there is a British bird artist. Um, let's see. I'm looking over on the shelf. It'll uh, take me a while to find the, the, the book, but um, there is a British bird artist who's written a book on how to draw birds. And it is all in this technique of, he's going initially directly in with just very light watercolor to block it in, much like we do with our non-photo blue pencils. Um, and that might be an interesting thing for you to, to check out. I will try to find that book on, and in a future, um, class, hold that up. And if you can't wait for that, shoot me an email and say, Jack, I got to know now who did that book. And I will uh, uh, respond to your, your, your email on that. That's really neat that you're developing that style and technique. Um, what? What? No. Oh. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I had a question about the Sally C class that's tomorrow? Um, yes, I don't know if I'll be able to answer it, but yes, please. Um, how do you register? Because um, when you went there, there wasn't a registering thing. Ah. Um, one way to do that, I, uh, I, I think we probably should get them to um, post the link on there. Um, thank you for letting me know that that's not on there. Um, you could also go to there. I know they have a Facebook page. And if we were to join that group, you could probably find an announcement through it through there. But we should get it so that you can join. Um, um, let me, I'm not going to, is it on the Nature Journal Club community calendar? Um, Um, let's see. Um, oh, I forgot about that. Uh, um, please visit the join us page on our website. Ah, okay, yes, here, here it is. Um, they, they say uh, we uh, meet each month over Zoom. Please join us, visit the join us page on our website to sign up to receive the meeting link. Um, so if you go to my website, johnmuirlaws.com, um, you will find um, a link there um, that will bring you to their website 
you sign up there and you will receive the meeting link. So it's a little bit, a few steps in there, but it looks like, yeah, they don't have it um, just as click from, from this. Um, and it looks like that's the way they're doing it. It's 3 a.m. our time, Jack. <laughs> well, the uh, Ray, Ray Bonto, um, we, we've, we've often been just, just so impressed by your enthusiasm and uh, uh, at taking all these, 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 these workshops. We've got to get more folks in the UK um, teaching nature journaling classes. Um, so that you don't have to stay up late uh, uh, for those. So for folks in the UK, you want to start teaching some uh, workshops and, and classes, let me know and we will link, uh, help you uh, be able to uh, link your classes through the Nature Journal Club um, Facebook community calendar. Um, we want to hear from you so that Ray Bonto does not have to stay up late. Or he can um, start his own club. No. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not yet, not yet. Of course, of course, of course. Yes, yes, yes. But um, okay. and uh, uh, Ray Bonto, were you to 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 start your own club and lead classes? I think there'd be you'd have a bunch of follows. People are um, really uh, inspired by the stuff that you're doing. But um, yeah, let's um, anybody who wants to um, start your own nature journal club um, or and do classes online. You can connect to those those to, to the larger community through this or through our community calendar. Um, Avea says, "I join Ray Bonto's club. Sign me up, big heart." Um, the uh, so you've got something else to show there. Um, I am going to make myself disappear if I can. Ah, there I go. So from where? Twittering, I collected these treasures and I was just drawing them. Oh, that's really fun. Yep, and very Keith Brokey like um, that nice dark toned paper um, with graphite and gouache. And uh, it's not gouache. I use, I've run out of gouache and now I can't find my tube um what are you using for your white i've run out of white pencil also but so i'm using a posca marker oh wow but, um should i get it no they would probably know what's a posca marker. <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay come on Ah, oh, uh, so so uh, uh, just going. I'm gonna interrupt for just a second. People are, are saying they don't see the class you mentioned on the calendar. So there are two calendars. So if you go to johnmearlaws.com and you go to calendar, you'll see that the top one is events with JML. And if you scroll down a little bit on that same thing down below that, you'll see Nature Journal Club Community Calendar. And that has classes with JML. It has classes with um, Ivea. It has classes with Melinda. It has classes with the Salish Sea Nature Journal Club with all these folks. So you can, um, it's sort of the one-stop shop. Maybe we can put the link to that in the, um, in the, the, the notes. Thank you. Um, so um, uh, Ray Bonto, thank you so much for, for sharing those, uh, those latest observations. I've got a question for you. Are there any more developments with your observations with our friends, the pigeons? No, not yet. Not yet. All right. It's so it's it's really exciting to me to to see how looking at that one group of birds, you were able to just dig deeper and dig deeper and dig deeper and dig deeper. Each time you went out there, you were seeing more and more. Um, again, about this thing that most people just go like, oh yeah, it's pigeons. I know what pigeons are, right? But you proved us all wrong. Each time you had just so much more, the, all those really cool observations you found, this, this tremendous range of variation. Also, it, yeah. it's, it's interesting where you are, London is one of the best places to see variations in pigeons um, because there are many pigeon fanciers 
people who raise pigeons and then the pigeons get away and then the pigeons breed and they kind of go do their pigeon thing and they run around the city doing pigeon things. Um, you are able to, you, you have a tremendous diversity of the, uh, you know, all these different things that people have done to kind of breed, to take the, 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 the rock pigeon um, or rock dove and breed it into all these just crazy different forms. Um, and because many people in London were interested in doing that as kind of a hobby, Oh. Um, you're able to see there a, a bunch of these really interesting forms. So that's, it's so cool that you picked up on that. And uh, thank you for sharing all those notes. So when we walk down the high street, I often, obviously I don't have that observation skills like his. Um, so he goes to the park alone and observes his pigeons. And if we are walking on the high street and he tells, oh, you, you remember this pigeon I told you about? You remember this pigeon I told you about? And I okay i have no clue what he's talking about but he's a, he knows which pigeon he's talking about and then it's uh, it's quite nice actually yeah it's amazing when when we journal these things they get locked into our brains in such a different way um and yeah you now uh, ray bonto has just this mental map of pigeon biodiversity um do check out if you haven't yet um project pigeon watch was, um, I think it was also produced by Cornell, was an educational program to get people, you know, starting to kind of learn some uh, basics of nature observation by looking at pigeons. You have taken it to a much higher level, but they had some cool resources in there, like these charts of all the little, you know, variations in the pigeons and things like that. You might be interested in checking that out. All right. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. For that. Thank you. Really good to see you.